ladies, gentry, whoever, I'm on the verge of sweating, so if you don't mind, I'm going to take my jacket off. <laughs> talking about uh, not in any sort of serious level of detail or seriousness in itself, uh, feasibilities and reviews, uh, as I said, some lessons learned over the last 10 years that I've been doing these things. Um, just to manage people's expectations, I'm just going to mention what I'm not going to be talking about. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about uh, or I'm not going to be giving you a tick box on how to do feasibilities or due diligence. Um, I'm not going to be giving you any formal definition of feasibility studies. Um, I'm not going to um, tell you how to undertake a valuation of a mining project uh, or to how to fund a project. Um, uh, and there are many people in this room that know these things much better than uh, and I'm not going to give an overview of stock exchange requirements. So, lesson one, always leave with a disclaimer. <laughs> <coughs> um, so let's start at the beginning. The target generation. Could be a, an entrepreneurial geologist has an idea, although I rarely see those for quite honestly. <laughs> uh, someone finds an old mine deposit and looks <coughs> interesting due to increased metal prices or New demand, a good example would be in today's sort of environment, um, a tin mine with lithium. Uh, suddenly it's a lithium mine with tin. Um, or a company inherits exploration rights due to a merger and acquisition. And there are many other ways of, of um, acquiring some new target. So, uh, just to put, put you through the project development process of 101. Those in very simple terms, you've all seen this, I'm sure. Um, exploration resources at the target generation side of things leads to a concept or a, or a preliminary, for certain words I can't get through my mouth, preliminary one of them, preliminary um, economic assessment, a PFS, preliminary feasibility study, a definitive feasibility study, and that goes into uh, detailed design. And um, EPC, and eventually, hopefully, we've got a productive mine. Um, at each step of those um, of those development uh, processes, uh, money is required. I hope at the end, somebody gets a return. Um, but some people get returned by selling a project at, say, concept level any point during that process. So there's money going in and there's money going out. And of course there's, there's feedback loops uh, often at uh, say concept level would lead to uh, the fact that there's not enough work's being done on the exploration side of the resources and high enough to support the project, whatever, and there's a feedback loop that goes back to the beginning and start again or do more work. And sometimes uh, some of those processes are skipped, which is not a very good idea, often. Um, however, just to put some sort of idea of risk to this, um, at grassroots exploration level, and I was doing, uh, say, salt sampling, maybe some limited trenching, uh, there are typical numbers quoted of Moving from there to actually having a project that works, roughly about a one in 10,000 chance of something actually happening. So that gives you a perspective on the sort of level of, kind of call it risk or level of success if you like. At PFS level, uh, it's around about one in 200. So one in 200 uh, preliminary feasibility studies actually leads to successful projects. And at DFS level, it's about one in one in a hundred. The interesting one, actually, once it's in production, uh, for a mine to meet its um, production intention within cost, 
it's about one in five. In other words, twenty percent uh, actually get to where it should be. So not a very not a very good record of success. Okay, so just very quickly going through some of the basic definitions. Um, a concept study or a preliminary economic assessment or a scoping study or a level one um, is typically within 30 to 50 percent accuracy. Uh, and I, I would certainly suggest that AIM should be around about 30 percent. Uh, based on a reasonable level of exploration for the limited test work in engineering. Um, the uh, main reason for doing these studies is to really determine additional study parameters and to decide whether to continue or not. A pre-feasibility study. Interestingly, um, going back to the concept study, it's got a number of different terms. Um, those terms come from uh, sometimes it's a code requirement. Um, the Canadian 43101 often refers to preliminary economic assessments. Um, some people refer to scoping studies, some people refer to concept studies. Essentially, they're pretty much the same. These pre feasibility studies, I've only come across the term pre feasibility study, there's only one, one term for it, or potentially two, level two. Order that the mining houses use the term level two. And that's typically between 20 and 25 percent accuracy. Um, these should include a range of trade off studies to optimize uh, the project going forward, so essentially to establish one go forward option. It should include um, uh, the environmental and social impact assessments, etc associated with that. Uh, should include a significant amount of test work, maybe not completely um, covered, but enough to get you within that 20% accuracy. And test work covers both the geotechnical and the metallurgical. Uh, and typically it's used to estimate a reserve and to raise further funds. The feasibility study, or the definitive feasibility study, Level three estimate should be within 10 to 15 percent, um, and again, I would aim for around about 10 percent, which is quite a challenge. Um, it's similar to the PFS, uh, but it's more accurate and typically based on one go forward option. So, you've done your PFS, you've done a lot of trade off studies, hopefully. By the time you've got to a feasibility study, your trade-offs really should be finished. You should know exactly which direction you're going. Uh, it's called a bankable feasibility study. Only once a financing agency has done independent due diligence on it. Uh, so don't be lured into uh, uh, a lot of people call these things bankable feasibility studies, but it's really they're not. They, they might be definitive feasibility studies, but not bankable until that independence due. Um, again, it's used to uh, it's used to raise further funds, um, and often used to sell the project to maybe an exploration company. Uh, it's maybe an inappropriate company to take that project forward into production. And that's a good time to, to sell it on to somebody who wants to take it into production. Um, it provides the main parameters for the detailed engineering. Construction, but it's not a detailed design for engineering construction. I've often seen projects built on the basis of the DFS uh, without that detailed design being done, and that's often leads to a disaster. <coughs> um, you, there are quite a few um, quite a few sources of information around to give you more detail on these things. That's one of them. If you want to. Know, reference that, but um, I can give you quite a lot more detail around the definitions of these things. Okay, let's just uh, move on to where my own frustrations are. The mining industry, as a lot of you are sure are aware, is notoriously conservative. The funders of mining projects are even more so. 
see the lid at the back there is smirking. <laughs> There is reluctance to consider new technology or innovative technology at the feasible at the steady stage due to, due to risk. But this is the best time to consider innovation. Uh, the solution is many more trade-offs at the BFS level. For example, I'll, I'll list us some examples there, I won't go through them. Um, and there are many more examples. Uh, and I think uh, you know, one of the other lessons I've learned here, I'm going to put it down there as a sort of a YouTube lesson, is that these things are really not done in sufficient, um, either in sufficient detail or with sufficient innovative thinking behind them um, at the BFS level. Okay, let's move on to due diligence. Um, Again, whether it's a due diligence, a peer review, an audit, similar, kind of similar things. Um, I'm often involved with my colleagues you know, as expert witnesses. It's a similar sort of, a similar sort of job as well. Um, it's an independent check on the accuracy of the estimates. Essentially, a project assessment um, and/or a gap analysis. It could be detailed and take up to three months to complete. Um, typically, when that happens, the person that's asked for the due diligence, whether it's a funding agency or a potential somebody taking over the company, uh, it's, a, it's, in my experience, it's a good indication they actually really don't want to buy it or to make the money. They're trying to find issues if it's a long, detailed due diligence. Or it's a high level paper for analysis, and that could only take three weeks. In my experience, when that happens, you know actually they've already made the decision. They just want someone to rubber stamp it. Um, so you've got to, as somebody who undertakes these things, you've got to understand a lot of the politics behind it um, and, and react accordingly. Um, is there a better way of doing things? Um, the, the one comment I can make here is the independent review should be involved uh, at the trade-off optimization stage, in other words, at the PFS level, rather than when the DFS has been completed. It's much better for the organizations that are doing this, this study work to have somebody independent come in at a much earlier stage than what, what currently happens. Um, you know, by the time you finish your DFS, the money's been spent the project's pretty much fixed on how it's going to work. Uh, now you've got somebody independent in and saying, no, 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 you can't do it like that. There's a problem here. Uh, it's, far, it's actually far too late. Um, it should be done much earlier. Um, and the, the people doing the, the study work uh, should make use of somebody independent, uh, almost like a, a partner, to take them forward and, and make sure there's a sounding board um, to sure the trade-offs are done and make sure the, uh, uh, all the appropriate estimates have been done. Okay, doing a due diligence, it's not, it's not rocket science. Um, that's the helicopter view. Uh, you, make, you need to make sure the mineral resources are there. Um, you need to make sure that the mining methods um, are appropriate. Can the ore material be economically and safely mined? Uh, the processing, uh, can, it be, is it, uh, can it be processed, uh, is it appropriate for the mineralogy? Um, a typical example we come across is the transition zone between oxide to sulfide, often ignored, uh, and the processing plant uh, often does not give the recoveries they expect across the, that trans transition in all. Um, logistics and market, marketing, can the process product be sold and the sales process proceeds be utilized by the owner? Um, sounds quite simple, uh, but often that's not met. Uh, is there appropriate transport systems in place? Uh, more appropriate for full materials? Um, legal and social environment, have the, have the legal 
rights for furniture in particular? Um, and does the project have the social license to mine, which is obviously very important uh, today? Uh, management, um, again, it's an area that's, that's uh, maybe not ignored, but not in a focus plane on it. Does the owner have or can they source the managerial, technical, and financial resources to carry out the proposed mining operations? Um, and then finally, it all comes together in the financial analysis. You know, obviously, is the cash flow is the cash flow accurate? Are the appropriate discount factors being used? Um, again, in our experience, um, often not. Um, you know, things like country risk taking into account in determining these uh, discount factors. Are the appropriate exchange rates and inflation rates? Some history on due diligence, it goes all the way back to the Agri Recovery in 1956. <coughs> I'll read this out verbatim, it's worth reading out verbatim. A prudent owner, before he buys shares, ought to go to the mine and carefully examine the nature of the bank, for it is very important that he should be on his guard, lest fraudulent sellers of shares should deceive him. Mark Twain in 1866 allegedly described the mine as a hole in the ground owned by a liar. <laughs> <laughs> the less said about 3x in 1996, uh, the better. Um, suffice to say, the 3x scandal resulted in uh, the publication of all the codes we see today. <coughs> the history of mine performance relative to the expectations from feasibility studies disappointing, as I pointed out previously. And shows no sign of improving over time, despite the advent of, of spreadsheets and computer simulations. Uh, it's uh, the accuracy of, of, of trying to predict my performance uh, still leaves a lot to be desired. So, lesson two be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> okay, some. Facts, the, the codes, have, as I mentioned, have gone a long way to eliminate errors from resource statements. However, I'll put a slide on to dilution a little bit later. Um, dilution is a big problem in uh, reserve estimates. There's been much research over the years, and I do have a, a reference at the end. Um, you can have a look at some of those references which consistently indicates that the actual capital cost exceeds BFS estimates by around about 25% on average, and it's larger than that for smaller projects. Um, a detailed due diligence will only go so far in identifying potential problems. Um, we're often asked, believe it or not, to do a due diligence without going on a site visit. Um, I just want to make some comments on the importance of site visits. Some of you in the audience, I'm, I'm not putting any names to these, uh, but some of you will <laughs> recognize some of the photos. That's, that's actually a the photographer is standing on top of a Kelsey. Um, that's the outcrop of a Kelsey, obviously in quite a wet, jungly type of environment. Uh, that pool of water there is the head, headwaters of the major river in the area. Uh, the Kelsey turns out to the to, the Kelsey itself turns out to be the major aquifer, um, and that water that you can see on you can see at the bottom of the photo there is actually pouring out of the water of the Kelsey itself. We went back and had a very close look at the moisture being assumed uh, in this project, um, the quality of the coal, and suffice to say. Um, it was being advertised as a high quality, bituminous coal. Uh, we, rate, we barely rated it as being high, to be quite honest. Um, this is actually, I think I've got two that are very similar. Um, this is a, a quarry, quite a large quarry in Kenya. Um, obviously, there's some safety and health issues here, um, and housekeeping issues. That guy standing, it's not obvious on the photo, in fact, but he hasn't even got any boots on, he's in his bare feet there. Um, so we went back to the, uh, 
budget estimate and insisted they put a little bit more money in to uh, essentially, uh, sorry, you may not be aware, but that's the top of the jaw crusher. That's the lead apron to the top of the jaw crusher. Maybe they should spend a little bit more money on uh, on uh, PPA equipment and uh, sorting out their uh, their jaw crusher. Um, we couldn't believe they knew we were coming. We couldn't believe that they actually let us photograph this thing and do a few deliveries on it. Um, this is a chrome mine in Turkey. Um, and again, we had to go back and insist that they increase their budget to build their access road. They didn't seem to think that they actually needed uh, any further access to what they We could hardly walk there. Um, so how they expected to get chrome out of those mountains, I have no idea. So just to highlight the importance of the site visit. Oh, this final one. Um, it's actually related to the first one. It's also in a uh, quite a humid tropical environment. Not quite that obvious by the photograph, but it's a very hilly environment. Um, they were planning to put a rail line in about 60 kilometers, if I remember rightly. Um, they hadn't even they hadn't surveyed the route yet. They hadn't bought it's all private property. They hadn't bought the property where they were intending to put this rail line through and they were expecting to complete that within two years. Um, we tell them to change that to 10 years. In fact, we were very nervous in that 10 years. We were thinking actually a property should have been about 12 years. Um, in fact, at the mine, about 50 kilometers away, I had a similar problem. They, they were on year 10 and they still had another two years to go. Um, so uh, 10 years was optimistic. I said I was going to talk about pollution briefly, one slide. In our experience, it's consistently underestimated, especially for narrow bodies. Uh, there are two elements. There's planned pollution. That's usually re reasonably motivated, but there's always unplanned pollution. That's often underestimated and even ignored. Uh, the solution is to benchmark against civil operations. Uh, and if it's an operating mine to implement robust mental, mental accounting systems. Capital cost estimates. Uh, well, there's a lot of controllable problems for capital estimates. And uh, that is typically what a typical due diligence would go through and try to identify those. I won't go through them. Um, but there's also uncontrollable problems which you've got to account for, uh, such as unclement weather, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the last one is probably very important, changes in the environment or other government regulations uh, that, that has, a, has had over the last few years quite a big impact on, on various projects. These and many more are all identifiable in the due diligence. However, all these factors have only a weak association with capital cost overruns, as they are normally highlighted by the due diligence. So hopefully you can capture most of these things at the due diligence phase. Just a little bit of red flag for some of the juniors. I don't know if there's any, any representation here from the junior miners, but some lenders are only too keen for cost overruns within reason. They earn money from additional transaction fees and high interest rates. They eventually may even take over the ownership of the asset. So really it's in your interest to get a good estimate uh, and, and get a realistic uh, funding package in the first place. There are three factors which have a strong influence on cost overruns. Where the project is in the pricing cycle. A rapidly rising mineral price, which was a hot market, I don't think we're quite there yet, uh, is strongly associated with cost overruns. This is largely balanced by stronger revenue, so value is not necessarily eroded, but certainly a loss of potential value. 
Second one is integrated design and build teams. We're the author of the DFS, it's the same as the EPCM. Uh, there is a lower likelihood of cost overruns. However, this is due to a lack of optimization and a bias of the EPCM to overinflate capital estimates and DFS levels for obvious reasons. And then thirdly, project quality. A marginal project is more likely to have cost overruns than a higher value project. Why are costs consistently underestimated? There are Sorry, I'm just going to turn my. I've got one of these stomachs that my belt doesn't help with much anymore. <laughs> um, first of all, there are far too many projects requiring funding and funds available. Therefore, there is pressure on engineers by project sponsors to inappropriately optimize to increase return in MPV to increase the ranking with, fund with funders, but everybody does it. Study work not done to the appropriate levels of accuracy. Engineers and consultants are often given an inappropriate budget. And it's happened to us. Consultants often tell we have 50,000 pounds, whatever the number is. Do what you can with that, uh, irrespective of what the size of the project is, how much work required. Engineering consultants are pressurized to optimize by the project sponsor resulting in underestimated capital costs. Since these costs are barely discounted being incurred during the early stages of the project, the MPP of project or the project may improve dramatically as a result of underestimated capital costs. Okay, so I've only been at this for 10 years. What, what has changed over the last 10 years? The new projects, the highest risk for new projects is now recognised as social or the local licence demand. I don't think there's any surprises there. But this can cause years of delay. The best indicator of success, that is meeting the value estimated in the EFS, is the quality of the project team. This is not a technical issue. It's actually the people you have on the ground there. If you have a really good team, uh, the chances of success is so much higher. For existing operations, the highest risk for existing projects is now disasters or black swan events, which is a, uh, a, uh, a popular new term for these things. Um, so they're unpredictable large events typically. Um, they're often rare events that have serious reputational, reputational impact and potential to close the mine. The best mitigating factors for this is to have a robust and appropriate disaster management system. I'm not going to go through this in any detail, it might embarrass a lot of people in the room. Uh, but there are many well known examples. Um, yeah, all these are in the public domain, so I don't mind putting them up on the screen. Um, and they, they range from uh, Transport issues, uh, resource quality issues, strategic errors, metallurgical dilution again, um, delays, lack of social license to operate, um, buying a project right at the peak of metal price. Uh, you know, basically somebody was taking a bet, uh, and again, metallurgical issues. And uh, the lesson there is we hear about the failures, but I don't think as an industry we really promote our successes enough. Okay, recommendations. Uh, take them or leave them. Um, I would certainly recommend to keep to the level two, level one, level two, level three process. Don't skip a level. Uh, try and meet the 30, 20, 10 percent accuracy levels respectively. Have an independent consultant undertake feasibility studies, but insist on strong integration skills. Undertake rigorous independent due diligence at an earlier stage. And I would recommend the middle of the PFS uh, to test sufficient trade-offs have been done. A due diligence report should be paired with the PFS going forward to further funding for consistency and audit. 
from this to test the robustness of projects by applying a baseline 25% increase in costs as a sensitivity. And it could be smaller for larger projects, but larger for smaller projects. And a similar sensitivity test for dilution, especially the narrow vein type deposits. Practitioners of due diligence and funders should be aware of the mineral price sample or they'll tell them to understand this impact on actual costs. Yeah, as I've said, uh, I did use quite a lot of references, um, so it's a lot of plagiarism in this presentation. Um, and uh, there's some very interesting articles. You can find most of these on the internet, I'm sure. Um, so there's, there's been quite a lot of work done, surprisingly now, when I first started looking at this. Um, done on why projects don't meet the expectations. <clears throat>